Um, so we have the great pleasure to listen to um, Sophie Lander today, who's from University of Twente, and at the same time also from University of Genoa. Um, not anymore, but, not anymore. <laughs> Twente, just came from there. <laughs> if people have questions during the talk, then uh, there are multiple options. You can either just put them in the chat, and then I will interrupt the talk at some point and uh, ask them for you or ask you to ask them. You can also just uh, unmute yourself directly and ask them. And if it's a very general question, maybe you can also end it, ask it at the end. All these options. <clears throat> now, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And yeah, also welcome from my side. It's a, it's a great pleasure for me to, to speak here today. And um, I decided to, to give a, a rough overview about several work I've done in, in the last couple of years. And I realized that I have missed one of my co-authors, Johannes schmidt -Hieber. So Johannes, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, the most recent work is with him and I will present a bit of it today as well. Um, yeah, so I guess all of you have heard about the, the great success story of, of deep learning, and I don't want to go too much into, into details why this method is so amazing, but just to name a few examples, um, it solves um, tasks in speech recognition, image re recognition in the, in the autonomous driving, in the medical field, and so on and so on. So there are many, many areas where deep, le deep learning achieves um, bre breathtaking results, and and then sometimes weird stuff is happening, like here when the network tells us a completely wrong thing. So on, on this picture here, the network tells us it's a Granny Smith, which is right, it's a, spe a specific type of apple. And if we add a sign on it, then it is suddenly pretty sure about that it's an iPod. And this example is, is pretty funny, but it can get serious if it comes to applications of, of deep learning in the areas of the medical in the medical field or also in the autonomous driving. So the first question people ask me if, if they yeah, want to understand why I'm doing deep learning theory is yeah, why, why do we need a theory for a method which is successfully driven by trial and error? And to me, one of, of the main reasons is actually this lack of explainability and transparency, which if we, I mean, if we don't understand the whole procedure, then this can lead to an unreliable method and then some weird stuff is happening. We do not really understand why. And then the decisions potentially made by these networks can also result in legal or ethical implications, especially if, if we apply them in the autonomous driving or diagnostic imaging. And I know the, the whole understanding of the method is kind of out of reach right now, because if we compare what we analyze in theory and what we apply in practice, we will see that there's a huge gap between the architectures. But um, still, I think the, the part which is the most reachable right now is that we could at least better structure existing results if, if we would have an overall theory of the whole procedure. So right now there are hundreds of articles appearing every month and um, no one really sees what was already done and what where are the gaps. So um, yeah, to better structure existing results and, and encompassing theory would be, a, would be a great help. Yeah, and then the last hope would be to also use theoretical analysis to even improve method and practice. So maybe we get some insights into specific features and then can maybe improve it properly. The question is now, why don't we have this theory already? And the problem is actually that explaining the procedure of neural networks for a special application at hand is a highly complex task. So we have to think about the right network architecture, including the number of hidden layers and number of neurons per layer. We have to think about the right um, activation function, and one also has to describe the optimization algorithm. 
And this is why many of the theoretical results can be only categorized to one of these aspects and assume the rest is fixed. So one can roughly divide the existing literature in three parts, approximation, generalization, and optimization. And this uh, intersection in these three parts is actually not only something which is true for neural network, it's also for many other learning uh, or estimation problems. So in approximation, we deal with questions about how rich is this function class? So what kind of functions, for example, with a specific smoothness can be approximated by this specific class of, of estimators or just of functions in this case? In, in generalization, we think about how well does the empirical risk minimizer performs relatively to the true one, so relatively to the best possible prediction rule one could expect. And um, in the optimization, we deal with the alg algorithm of the, the whole procedure. So how good does the optimization algorithm performs relatively to the empirical risk minimizer? And my today's talk will be mainly on, on these two aspects here. So we will mainly focus on empirical mis risk minimizers um, and in, in a, a bit more restrictive result in a shallow network, I will load later also include the optimization algorithm. But for, for most of the results, we, we deal with the empirical risk minimizer and assume that we just find the best possible estimator in the function class accor according to a specific loss we apply. But first of all, what kind of, of problems are we dealing with when we analyze neural networks? So what we usually have given is um, a set of data, for example, images here on these images, you see chihuahuas and muffins, and the, we assume that there exists a functional relation between the images and the corresponding labels, which are in this case a binary classification problem, so it's a muffin or a chihuahua. What we now have is a, is a class of, of um, functions, and in our case, it's a neural network. So we first of all have a model. And what we want to do is we want to use our data to adapt the model to, yeah, we, we want to, yeah, to adapt the, the model to the, or to find the, the proper parameters for the model. And what do we mean by finding the proper parameters is we apply some sort of, of loss function which measures how good does our model um, fit the data we give them. And there are um, different losses we can choose. It also depends on, on the um, problem we are in the end analyzing. So roughly we can divide it in, in classification and in, in non-parametric regression. So depending on that, we either choose the cross entropy loss or the, the least squares loss. Okay. In practice, um, this loss is not, we just, we don't just use the minimal um, value of this loss. It would be nice if we would find that, but in practice, we, we minimize it by, or we approximately minimize it by applying a gradient descent or variance of the gradient descent, for example, stochastic gradient descent and, and this kind of thing. This is the optimization part I was talking about, but this is what we also exclude today so we just assume we find the the minimum the parameters with the minimal loss here and the questions i am actually interested in is what is happening if we extend this number of samples here so if we give the network more data how fast will it convert to this true unknown function f and this is in the end the rate of convergence we are interested in and yeah, this is something we will analyze in more detail in the following. And in the first result, I want to talk about a bit more in um, non parametric regression and feed forward neural networks. Later, we will talk about image classification and convolutional neural networks. So let me roughly um, tell you what is non parametric regression about. Similar as before, we have given a, a random vector x, y, um, this time x is an rd valued random vector uh, and, and r and y is real valued. So it's not discrete anymore, it's a real valued, well, uh, fact, uh, a real valued random vector, yeah. Um, and then we are interested between the functional relation between x and y 
And as I showed you before, we are in particular searching for a function f star, which minimizes this least squares loss here, this or this L2 error. Okay. And now one can show that this minimum here holds for a function m of x, which is equal to the expectation of y given x equal to x. And this is why we call this m here our regression function. Now we would be finished if we would know the distribution of x and y. Unfortunately, this is not the case for most of the practical applications. The only thing we have given are these data x1, y1 to x and yn, which share the same distribution as x and y and which are independent. So what we do is we take these data and try to reconstruct an estimator mn, and we want to reconstruct it in a way that our um, that the L2 risk to the true uh, regression function gets small. And as I told you before, we want to talk about neural networks today. So in our case, we are considering functions mn out of a class of, of neural networks, which are defined as follows. So first of all, a simple feedforward neural network, we have to fix an activation function. And there are many functions to choose. Um, earlier in the days, people used smooth activation functions like the sigmoidal function or also the tangent hyperbolicus. But uh, because of some um, optimization reasons, the ReLU activation function is kind of state of the art right now. And this is the, the function maximum of x and zero. So it's just zero as long as the input is negative and just extract the, the input for positive input. After we have chosen activation function, we have to fix the network architecture. And here we have two parameters. First, a positive integer L, which denotes the number of hidden layers we have, and a width vector K, which describes the number of neurons in the first second till the L thin layer. And then we can define our neural network architecture as um, the composition of these activation functions, where we, before we apply again an activation function, we always weight the output. So here you see in the beginning, we have our input X and we weight the whole thing by a matrix W1. And then we apply a shifted version of, of this ReLU activation function. So we just shift the, the output by um, a vector V1, which is the bias term then. Then we weight it again by a weight matrix. We, apply, we again apply an activation function and so on and so on. And we do that L time because we have a network with L hidden layers and in the end we weight the output. One can also think about a neural network in a graphical sense and um, here we see a network with uh, input dimension four and two hidden layers with five neurons in each, each of them. And each of these nodes in these networks here st stay for a weighted sum of the neurons of the previous layers, which are shifted by the spires term, and then we apply the activation function. So this graphical definition and the algebraic definition before are exactly the same thing. Um, with the main difference that it's nicer to think about networks in this way, but it gets super hard to analyze them, especially if we deal with super deep networks. In the end, we have to define an estimator out of this function class, and therefore we also need a criterion, and we use the empirical risk minimization. So we choose the MN, which minimizes this least squares loss here, and F um, of FF, LN, and RN is our class of fully connected neural networks with L hidden layers and R neurons in each layer. And for theoretical reasons, we also have to truncate this estimator on some level constant times log n, which means that the final estimator mn is equal to mn tilde as long as its absolute value is smaller than, than this constant times log n, and otherwise we cut it there. And now we want to take this estimator and analyze its expected L2 error. And in particular, we are interested in a bound and its dependence on the sample size n. This is what I told you before. So now we want to increase the sample size and we want to see how fast converges this m n to m. And this is then the rate of convergence, which tells us yeah, how good is this estimator actually. The next question we have to deal with is for what kind of regression functions do we want to perform our estimator well? And 
it would be the best to show nice rates for all possible regression functions. Unfortunately, we would get trivial results. So we need at least some assumptions. And the classical approach is to take a sort of a smoothness. I call it a PC smoothness, um, which is defined as a Hölder smoothness for higher order derivatives. But for simplicity, just think about a P times contingency differentiable function. And for this kind of regression function, Stone could already show in 1982 that the optimal rate of convergence an estimator can achieve is given by this n to the minus 2p over 2p plus d. The problem of this rate here occurs when d gets large relatively to p, because then this term here gets super, super small because the d gets bigger and bigger, and then this rate gets slow. And this phenomenon is known as the curse of dimensionality. So if this rate here, which is an optimal one, would be the right, or if, if this class of regression functions would be the right one we should consider for our neural networks, then we could not expect a better rate as this one here as it's optimal. But in the same way, this rate does not really give us, an, us any explanation why these networks perform so well, especially in these higher dimensional cases. So the setting is kind of useless for us. So the aim is to find a proper structural assumption on M, which makes us believe that we can also get better rates for the higher dimensions. And people already thought about it for a while, and it's not only related to neural networks, it's just in general, how, how can we improve this rate here? And one of the first ideas, I guess, is, is from Stone as well from 1985. So what he said is, okay, if our, our regression function has some additive structure, so is a sum of univariate functions GK, where each of these GK are PC smooth, then this these kind of regression functions have an optimal rate of n to the minus 2p of 2p plus over 2p plus d uh, plus 1 sorry so in this case we get rid of this d here and have only the dimension of, of one of these univariate functions so which is a one so you see this rate improves and is independent of the dim dimension he further extended this um, class of regression functions so, to so-called interaction models. In this case, the GIs here not depend on only one of the components, but on a, on a group of components where the cardinality is restricted by D star. And uh, where, again, each of these GIs here are PC smooth. Um, and yeah, the components can be differently for different um, summons, but in the end, it has to be restricted by D star. And for, for this kind of regression function, Stone showed a rate of n to the minus 2p over 2p plus D star. So we do not depend on the dimension D, but only on, on the um, cardinality of one of these interact of one of these, these summons here. So we see, okay, for both models, we are indeed not depending anymore on, on D. Another idea are so-called single index models. Um, here, our regression functions are assumed to be a function, can be described by a function G, where the input is beforehand weighted by a vector A. And um, these kind of models were later extended to so-called proje projection pursuit models. Um, or rich functions. So this kind of looks like a shallow neural network with the main difference that um, the, the functions GK can be different for different summons. So we do not have a fixed activation function as in the case of a shallow neural network. Again, these GKs here has to be, have to be PC smooth. And for this kind of, of, uh, of models, it, it was shown that the optimal rate is n to the minus 2p over 2p plus 1. So we learn that with all these kind of models, one can circumvent this curse of dimensionality. But of course, these rates can only be obtained in practice if the true, and then this function is of course unknown to us, um, regression function corresponds to exactly the structure. So the goal is to keep assumptions as low as possible, but to be to further have the belief that we can show a good rate of convergence for for these kind of functions 
And what we analyzed were regression That's functions. Can I yeah. interrupt? You? Please, please, yeah. There's a question for verification. Um, so it's about the regression function M. Yeah. Uh, what does it represent? Is it uh, so called? Can you read the chat? Ah, yeah, I can open it at least. Uh, I can read the question if you like. Sorry. Okay. I, I must have just lost attention for one second, and that was the critical second. Apologies. <laughs> so is, is is that regression function a projection of the higher dimensional space down to some smaller subspace that's to be identified or is it just a metric on the space um so the regression function is is, is just the uh do i get the projection of the space to, um no it's not a projection so it the regression function first of all just represents the functional relation between input and output this is what you what you get right right um yes that's fine i'm I just i was trying to to see how the different classes of functions and their dimensionality uh gave you a subspace that's all i was trying to figure out ah okay so um so i mean if we have if you have for example this additive model it's again not really uh, projecting something in a smaller subspace but we just assume some specific structure on it so some sort of uh, I would first uh, would just call it a sparsity or something you have in this function class. Um, Thank you. Does it answer your question? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I still consider that a subspace. It's it's a different kind, right? With a different set of bases and things, but um, it it doesn't necessarily have the the structure that you can exploit, except its dimensionality that you're trying to find. Okay. Thank okay. <laughs> Yeah, so we also thought about what kind of regression functions one should analyze. And um, so first of all, we also needed some practical motivation for this. And an observation um, one, one can see in many different applications is that the corresponding func functions um, describing the relation between input and output has some sort of an hierarchical structure. And I've brought the following heuristic from, from image processing. And for example, if you give the, the computer the task to, to classify this handwritten digit here, how could he solve this task? So first of all, you yeah, first of all, we have pixels of this image. And um, maybe the first step would be to detect neighboring, uh, to, to use neighboring uh, pixels to detect edges. By combining edges, one might find local patterns. And by combining these local patterns, we are in the end able to say, okay, which object or which number is on this, uh, on this image here. So you see this hierarchy I'm talking about, but what is even more important in this case here is that we do not need the whole input space for all of the subtasks here. So for example, to analyze this, this upper left edge here, we only need the upper left corner of the pixels. And this is exactly the motiv motivation of, of the following uh, definition of so-called hierarchical composition models. And these are defined uh, recursively. So first of all, we say M satisfies an hierarchical composition model of some level zero, F or M of X is just equal to one of the input components. And then we extend it to a level L plus one. If we take K functions of the previous level and combine them in a functional way by applying a function G. And this function G has now dimension K. And these functions F1 to FK are again hierarchical composition model of the previous level L, okay? To understand it a bit better, I've brought this example here. So here you see in hierarchical composition model of some level two, so okay we have this this function g where we apply uh, three functions of the level one these here so this this function here has dimension three and then each of of these uh, functions of level one are either of dimension one or uh, of dimension two or three and this pi here is just a, um, a permutation of of the um, input components okay What is interesting to see is not only, okay, maybe there is, maybe you agree that there is a practical application of it, but also it's a more general function class compared to the previous ones I, um, I presented you. For example, if we go back to these additive models, 
and um, we, we just take three the summons here, then we can see that we can rewrite it as a composition model by just setting, okay, each summoned is just a composition model of the level one, okay? And um, then when we take in the second level, just um, if we just choose the function in the second level to be the sum over these three components, then by composing these functions with the other three, we get exactly this additive model. So, okay, additive models can be written as an hierarchical composition model of level two. And this is what you can also show for the other classes. Sometimes it's a bit more difficult, but in the end, you, you can show it for all of them. What we, of course, need uh, to analyze these models is uh, some sort of a smoothness and order constraint, P. Uh, first of all, P is a subset of 1 infinity times N. And then we say that our function class, uh, if the, then we assume that each of the functions G have some special dimension K and are PC smooth for a tuple PK, which has to be in P. So what is important to see here is that functions in this hierarchical composition model can be of different dimension and different smoothness. They just have to, be, this tuple just has to be in this, in this set P here. And also within one level, they can, they can have different dimension and smoothness. For the following examples, we furthermore need two more assumptions. So first of all, uh, we say, okay, all the functions C also have to be Lipschitz continuous in, in the definition. And then we have these standard assumptions on, on the distribution of, of X and Y. So Y is sub Gaussian and the support of X is bounded. And then there's this famous result of, of Johannes Schmidt Heber from 2020, where he analyzed um, also an empirical risk minimizer based on a class of neural networks. And these networks has a logarithmic depth, uh, polynomial width, and um, a network sparsity, which is bounded by, by this term here. And he also analyzed networks with a relo activation function and and these um, regression functions fulfilling some hierarchical structure and show that that this rate is of n to the minus 2p over 2p plus k. So instead of d, we get only the dimension of one of the functions in the hierarchical uh, model. So in the end, this, this function here is uh, dominated by the worst combination between p and k. What he further has here is this network sparsity. And what does it mean? It means that not all neurons in consecutive layers are completely connected by each other. So the overall number of connections is restricted by this term here. A result of a similar flavor was shown by Bauer and Kohler in 2019. He, uh, he or they analyzed a, a bit more restrictive class of, of uh, fun regression functions, so-called generalized rectal interaction models. Here, in every second level, the, the functions G are a sum uh, of, of infinite smoothness. And in every other um, level, the, the dimension and smoothness is, is fixed to P and D star. They also defined a specific network architecture, which is sparse, and uh, they applied a sigmoidal activation function and showed a rate of n to the minus 2p over 2p plus d star. So again, we only depend on the dimension of the, of the hierarchical model and not on the dimension of the, um, of the whole input space. So what we learn from this is, okay, sparse neural networks are indeed able to segment the curse of dimensionality if we impose this erect field structure. And it also leads to the conjecture that in order to achieve this good rate of convergence results, one should use these networks which are not fully connected. And as my following result shows, this is not true. So what we analyzed were um, simple fully connected neural networks with two different settings. So on the one hand, we had uh, networks within uh, which are growing or which have a, which are super deep. So polynomial depth and a constant width and logarithmic depth and uh, a polynomial width. So either super wide or super deep. For both settings, we could show that the, the expected L2 error is bounded by, by this maximum of n to the minus 2p over 2p plus k. 
So if you remember the rate of, of Johannes before, you see we get exactly the same rate, but we don't need any sparsity constraint here. Why is this of interest? Um, if it comes to, to implementing these networks, um, for example, with Python's TensorFlow and um, Keras, then you will see pretty quickly that implementing a, a simple fully connected network with the specific number of, of uh, layers and neurons um, can be, can be uh, defined in, in six lines of code. But if you want to implement sparsity, it's not clear what kind of, of method you use. There are some, some different methods in the literature, but it's not completely convinc convincing what one wants to do to, to train these, these sparse networks. And of course, um, there are other questions how to restrict these class of regression functions. I mean, this hierarchical structure is nice, but um, it's definitely not true for all kind of problems. So there are other ideas how one could restrict it. Another art article of mine and co-authors um, assume there we assume some sort of regression functions with low local dimensionality, which means that the um, function depends locally only on a restricted number of components and is uh, uh, of course a uh, smooth. And we could uh, we could show a rate of convergence which depends only on this locally dim local dimensionality, but not on the global one. Then there are these famous results of Andrew Barron, um, where, where he considered the, the Fourier transform of, of regression functions and um, a class which is known as the Barron class um, with um, Fourier transform with a finite first moment. And he showed that for shallow neural network estimators, um, they, have a, they have a rate of one over root n. So again, this rate is not depending on the dimension d. And then there's a result of Suzuki from 2018, where he analyzed mixed piece of spaces and could also show dimension free rates. And these are only three examples. So there are more ideas in the literature, how to restrict this class of regression functions. Another idea would be, I mean, on the one hand, one could or can try to uh, restrict the structure of the underlying regression function. On the other hand, we could go in the geometric properties of the data. And the question is, are these estimators also able to exploit the structure of the input data? And for that, we assume that our X is concentrated on some D star dimensional Lipschitz manifold. So how did we define it? First of all, M is assumed to be a, a compact subset of RD. D star is chosen out of one to D and we call U1 to UR open coverings of M. If yeah, of course, if they are open and if they satisfy, satisfy that M lies is a subset of the union of all the ULs. We further need to define so-called B Lipschitz functions. We call them Psi1 to Psi R. And we have two constants, C psi 1, C psi 2. And on the one hand, these, these functions have to fulfill uh, the traditional Lipschitz condition. And we need this condition also the other way around for a smaller constant. And then we can define our D star dimension Lipschitz manifold if on the one hand, these B Lipschitz functions exist and if we have this open covering and if it holds that our Psi L of zero one to the D star is just the intersection of M and UL. And this is why we call, or and this is true for all the Ls here. And this is why we also call our Psi one to Psi R the parameterization of the manifold. Okay, and in case that our X is now concentrated on this manifold, that the regression function has some PC smooth or fulfills some PC smoothness, and our network is of logarithmic depth and polynomial width, then we can bound the expected L to error by n to the minus 2p over 2p plus d star. So this network is indeed able to exploit the structure of the input data because in the end, it only depends on the dimension of the Lipschitz manifold, but not on the overall global dimension we give them. Let me quickly um, sketch how we prove these kind of results. Um, so the first thing we do is that we can decompose this expected L2 error here in two terms. 
on the one hand, we, we have this term here, um, which measures the approximation power of the network. So how well can we approximate a regression function of a specific structure by a function f of this function class? And on the other hand, we have um, we have here a covering number or some measure of complexity with with who we yeah where we have to bound the the overall complexity of the function class. And I used the result of, of Peter Bartlett here, where um, the covering number or VC dimension can be bounded by the overall number of parameters in the network. So in the end, we have only Ln and Rn here in the in the bound. So what you see is um, the larger you choose the function class, meaning the larger you choose L and R, the larger this term here gets. But of course, the, the bigger the function class is, so the better the approximation power is. So what we have to deal with is with this trade-off between approximation power and the complexity of the network. So in the end, we're searching for this sweet spot here. Okay. This is what we did for, for, for the different results I showed you before. Can I ask one question? Yeah, please, please. Um, on the previous slide, you needed an L infinity distance between the regression function and the best approximation in your class, but yeah. you're proving an L2 error estimate, so which looks much weaker. So um, can you comment on the discrepancy here? Uh, so you mean that you don't have here an L2 instead yes. of an L infinity? Or um, you don't have L infinity on the left? Um, yeah, it's a good question. So, I mean, in the end, I only have an, uh, I have an integral and then an absolute value here on this side. So I just wrote it down for simplicity with this is infinity norm. But I think you also, yeah, you, you also need it. Um, even if I write it differently. Um, yeah, it's just an oracle inequality I applied. So I'm not, I, I agree that it's not sharp. Uh, so maybe one could, could do it better. It's just to, for simplicity, to, to deal with this approximation error. Yeah, yeah, but it's a good comment. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, but so let me comment a bit on this approximation error actually. So what we use is, that um, these networks have some, or these neural networks have the ability to approximate functions which can be written as compositions of other functions in case that we are able to approximate each function of this composition. Because networks also have this compositional structure, so the, in the end we can build it similarly as the, the function f itself. So if we break this idea of, for example, the hierarchical models down, we end up with realizing, okay, first of all, we need results for uh, functions um, for the square, for approximating the squares functions. And this was already done in 2016-17 by Matos Delgast and Jorotsky. So this was something we, we could just use. And by uh, combining these squared functions and applying, um, um, how, what's the name of it? the polarization equality, I guess, you can, you can also write down a multiplication of X and Y. And um, by doing so, we can extend this to approximating polynomials with neural networks. And in the end, we use that smooth functions can be approximated by Taylor polynomials, then we are already able to approximate smooth functions. And by combining smooth functions, we are in the end able to approximate these hierarchical models, for example. So, okay, let me summarize what we have learned until now. Um, neural networks are indeed able to segment the curse of dimensionality if we impose either a structural assumption on the regression function or geometric properties on the input components. We have further learned that all these results hold without any sparsity constraints. So I can say at least from a theoretical point of view, sparsity seems not to be the answer for the success of the neural networks. Now I come to the main throwback of, of the results, and this is actually that we exclude the optimization algorithm and the whole analysis. Because we are dealing with an empirical risk minimizer, but in the end we can't be sure that this empirical risk minimizer is close to the network which is trained, for example, by a gradient descent routine or something. So to really get an overall or all encompassing understanding, we really need to analyze all three aspects together. So we need to be in this intersection of all these three circles. 
And this is what we did in a simplified setting. So we went back to the 1980s and analyzed shallow neural networks, this time learned by gradient descent. And I want to show you in more detail what we did. So first of all, we, we chose another activation function, or uh, this is actually the result of Andrew Barron, but he also chose another uh, activation function. This is the sigmoidal activation function, this S curve I was earlier talking about. And then, the, and then he considered a class of shallow neural networks and these shallow neural networks yeah, our networks is one hidden layer, so you apply one times an activation function, you have a, um, you have a number of neurons of, of root n here, and he had a penalty term over the outer weights. And then he defined the least squares estimator by the principle of, of yeah, by the principle of least squares, of course. And for the assumption that the Fourier transform fulfills, uh, that the, the, uh, the Fourier transform has a finite first moment, the expected L2 error can be bounded by this rate of one over root n. And this result uh, was the starting point of our analysis. We wanted to extend it uh, by including the gradient descent in it. So the question is, is that also true for networks trained by gradient descent? And for that, we, we need a bit of notation. So this are the shallow neural networks and we describe by W the overall weight vector, including the outer weights, the inner weights and the bias terms. Then we, we use a loss function and here we use, the, use a penalized loss. So we have the least squares loss, but then we, we uh, extend it with the penalty term over the outer weights. Before we apply gradient descent, we have to initialize our weight. So we call W0 our initial weight vector. And in the beginning, we set all the outer weights to zero. And the inner weights are chosen uniformly, dis uniformly distributed on a sphere with radius Bn. And the, the gammas are un uniformly distributed on minus Bn root D to Bn root D. And then we apply gradient descent. So how does gradient descent work? We, we take and the, the weights of the previous step and subtract the learning rate times the gradient of the loss functions on this um, point of the weights. This is what we do Tn times and in the end we get an estimator with the with, uh, weights after T and gradient descent steps and again we have to truncate it on some level. For our analysis, we needed a slightly more restrictive um, assumptions on the Fourier transform of the regression function. So here the absolute value of f is bounded by this constant over omega to the d plus one times a logarithmic term. And this is what we could show. So first of all, we could, um, if the Fourier transform fulfills this, this special property, so this bound, and if we have a number of neurons of root n, if we choose b and the learning rate and the, the gradient descent properly, depending on the learning rate, uh, on the sample size, sorry, then the expected L2 error can be also bounded by this one over root n. So we get exactly the same rate as in the result of, of Andrew Barron, but this time the, the networks are trained by gradient descent. Let me sketch a bit what how we could show that. So the main trick of the result is actually that we can choose an, our initial weight vector already in a way that we can bound this guy here. So the our shallow neural network where the inner weights are like the initial weights and only the outer weights are adapted to the problem that this term here is already small. And then we can show that the inner weights here change only slightly during the gradient descent. Then we have to analyze the gradient descent, and this is how we finally show the, show the rates. The question is now, is this rate optimal? Unfortunately, it isn't, uh, but we could show a lower bound, and this lower bound is the following. So if we have um, the class of distributions, the same as before, then we can show that the, the expected L2 error is lower bounded by n to the minus one half minus one over d plus one. This inframum here is taken over all measurable functions of the data. And what you see is that in case that you're in high dimensions, then this guy here gets small. So we are pretty close to the, to the rate we achieved with the neural networks. The one thing you might have seen already in, in, this, um, in this proof here is that 
our um, our result already works for an estimator where only the outer weights are adapted and the inner weights are chosen as fixed um, depending on the on a properly chosen di distribution. So what we did is we chose a simplified estimator, a linearly squared estimator, where we chose the, the inner weights and the bias terms exactly as before, but only ad adjusted the outer weights to the problem. And then we choose a least squares um, uh, empirical risk minimizer, and this, this uh, problem here can be solved by solving a linear equation system. In the end, we also have to truncate it. And for, for this kind of simplified estimator, we could show exactly the same rate. So we, we take this number of summons, um, like, like the number of neurons, the BN has to be large enough. Again, we have this assumption on the Fourier transform and we get exactly this rate one over root N. So what we see is, okay, we get exactly the same rate as the neural networks learned by gradient descent. But of course, this simplified estimator is much faster in computations. And then there is this famous term, which is called uh, representation learning, which was introduced by Goodfellow and co-authors uh, in their book, Deep Learning, where they say that representation learning is one major task of, of machine learning or a major reason why machine learning um, applications work so well. So it means how well do these machine learning um, applications um, do the, the inner representation of the data. But if we now take the inner representation of our data, we see that this is the activation function applied to some random um, random inner weights and bias terms. So in our case, it's not a representation learning, we're just doing representation guessing in this case here. The question is now, how can we extend this, um, this approach to multiple hidden layers? And I unfortunately have to say, I have no idea. So there is this, this finding, this empirical finding on neural networks that these networks perform in a highly overparameterized regime. Um, that networks with a near perfect fit, fit to the training data have also a small test error. This is this well known double descent curve you might have already seen. And um, I also have shown you this decomposition in, in um, complexity and approximation error. But if you want to, to um, show that this overparameterized regime works well, you will quickly realize that this statistical learning theory won't work because the complexity will explode. You have a lot of parameters in the end, you have to bound them, bound your, your complexity by the number of parameters. So this statistical learning theory won't work. So the question many people are dealing with right now is why do these overparameterized neural networks learn? And there is an idea that there is some sort of, an, uh, maybe I show you this before. So why is the, the, the question is, why is this um, a bit confusing why this works? And we can take again the, the um, we can again take the example of the chihuahuas and the muffins. And um, how could a network look like to, that separates these classes? It could, for example, generate a bound like this here. But if we are in a highly overparameterized regime where we have many, many possible parameters, it could also look like this spiky curve here. In the end, these two, um, these two networks perform exactly the same on the training data, but I would expect that this spiky curve here won't work well on, on, new, on new test data. So yeah, small training error doesn't mean small test error. And the question is why, why do we get this small test error as well in this highly overparameterized regime? And there is a belief um, that there is some sort of an, of an implicit regularization in, in the method or in this gradient descent method. The, the gradient descent method finds a solution that generalizes well and which is maybe a low complexity solution. And this is also something people really try to understand um, if this gradient descent has this implicit regularization and if you find a connection to some explicit regularizations applications. The question is now how much time do I have because I could talk about image classification or I could stop the talk now. You have 
uh, nine more minutes, but there should be some questions in those time. Okay, so depending on the motivation, um, I could either talk about image classification or we just discuss what, what I have already told you until now, <laughs> depending on the interest of the listeners. I mean, our listeners are always very interested, but um, if there are questions now, we can, um, people can raise their hands. If not, we can just move on. The people okay. Decide. Okay. So I just go quickly over over image classification. So the first thing is maybe why why can't we use this non parametric regression approach also for image classification? So in in non parametric regression, you usually um, describe your output variable y by your regression function f plus some some noise factor. So it's some sort of denoising problem in the end. And um, if you if you now um, transfer this to, to image classification, so okay, this was exactly what I what I said before. Suppose we have a predictor to this data we have given, and we assume we have some sort of regression problem, okay? And if we now want to to analyze the prediction error of, of our um, estimator, then we decompose this in variance term and in a term. Um, where we bound the L2 error to the to the regression function. This was exactly what we are, were analyzing before. But in images, you expect to have a high variance. So if you, for example, consider different um, images of an elephant, you will see they can be look completely different, um, but they are all belonging to the same category. So in these cases, this variance term will always dominate the um, this term here. So even if you're able to to find a, um, a predictor a good predictor for the regression function this um this error for the for the labels in the end won't won't be good because it will be dominated by this variance here so we were what we were thinking about is maybe it's just um, a different way how one could consider images so in the i call it the machine learning perspective the machine learning perspective is that images are high, have a high dimension because every pixel is considered as a variable and in the end the goal is to learn this high dimensional variable for example in the mnest dim, dim, uh, data set uh, we have 28 times 10 to 8 uh, pixels which are um, dimension of 784 and then we are again confronted with the curse of dimensionality because the problem gets of course considerably harder if we increase the number of, of pixels the second idea would be to consider um, images as two-dimensional objects. So um, here we describe pixelated images um, X with pixels X, J, L, where each, each pixel is a function evaluated on the, on the data J over D, L over D. Okay, so D is the dimension and J and L is the position of the pixel. F is uh, now our unknown um, function, and is, it, um, it has a different value depending on the, the grayscale value, uh, on, the, on, the, yeah, on the grayscale of the image. And what, what, does, what is happening is that if we increase the number of pixels, we have more evaluations of this, or more points where we evaluate this function. So we expect that we even gain from a higher image resolution and we would expect better performance here. So the idea, our, the project with Johannes was based on is that every image of a specific class or in, uh, in a specific class can be described by random deformation of a template image itself. And there are ma many different ideas from functional data analysis and also from image registration, how to describe model random deformations. Um, but, but I will present a pretty simple model we, we first of all introduced to do our analysis with. And this are these images X. Um, this so first of all we say okay our our image X is just, can be described by these pixels X J L and each of these pixels are described by a template functions evaluated on these two points. Uh, what you should keep in mind is the smaller the 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 pixel uh, the smaller the function value the darker the pixel value. 
Um, the first, first deformation we applied is an illumination factor. So we multiplied each function value with a random factor eta. And by doing so, we can generate darker and lighter versions of the original image. The second thing we applied are random shifts on the x and y axis. How can one do that? We just subtract randomly a tau and tau prime in, in our function. And the last one are different scaling factors. So here we, we scale it on the, on the x and the y axis, and then we get this squeezed and scratched versions of the original image. And by combining all these three factors, we are in the end able to describe our deformation model. So our pixels xjl are in the, in the end described by a template function um, with the random illumination factor, random scaling and random shifts. And of course, we want to do classification and we are considering binary image classification here. So we have in the end n pairs of, of images and corresponding labels as it's binary, it's either zero or one. And um, then we have for the different pixels, we have again our deformation model, but this time, depending on the label, we have of course different template functions. The template function is unknown of, and also the different deformations are unknown. Uh, what we have to assume in the following is that our objects are completely visible on the image. So therefore we have to constrain the support of the function and also we have to restrict the possible deformations that are possible and we assume zero background. So there's no background noise at all. So the idea is now that we want to introduce different learning methods that are able to to learn these invariants of the classes because these two different um, deformations here do not change the 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 class label in the end and we had two different estimators but i only want to give you to show you what we could show for the for the convolutional neural networks because this fits perfectly to to what we saw before and for that we we need to introduce what a convolutional neural network is so first of all, these networks depend on three components, convolutional pooling and fully connected layers. And the most interesting part are these convolutions. What is happening here is that we define a small filter, which is a weight matrix actually. And this weight matrix slides over this image and at every position, it computes the sum of the Hadamard product between this filter and the, the pixels that are covered on this position by, by the, the filter. And by doing so, we, we generate these, these feature maps here. So we apply in the end different filters on it. And, um, and before we, we get this feature map, we have to apply an activation function component wise on, on the matrix we get out of, of this procedure here. This is just the more mathematical setting we use. So in our case, we only do one convolutional layers with, with K feature maps in the end. So we apply K different filters. The procedure I explained to you before with computing the Hadamard, the sum of the Hadamard product um, is just described by, by the star here. We apply our, our activation function. And in the end, we apply a global max pooling layer. So in the end, we just, just extract from every feature map the maximal value and this is then the output of of our of our um, neural network of our convolutional neural network then we apply a fully connected neural network so for, um, several fully connected layers and it's exactly the definition you saw before with the main difference that in the end we apply so called softmax function which maps the output between 0 and 1 so in the end we get a probability vector out here which tells us with how high the probability is that a specific input belongs to, to the one class. Okay, and then we combine these two like convolutional layers and fully connected layers. We take two M convolutional filters, a max pooling layer and a specific number of, of, um, of hidden fully connected uh, layers and the two outputs. Um, the, the question is now um, about the invariance of the convolutional neural network. So what, what it's pretty easy to see is that the convolutional neural networks are nearly invariant to shifts. 
but um, they are not invariant to the different scalings. And the question people were dealing with is, is it even desirable to construct these convolutional neural networks with just scale invariant? And the problem is that different scaling often comes with different resolutions. So, um, for example, um, objects with a small scaling are hardly recognizable on an on a, um, image with low resolutions. So we actually need different filters for, for the different scaling and different resolutions in the end. And this is exactly what we did. Um, so this is the framework we are analyzing. So what we first of all, okay, KI is our, um, our i-th label. Um, what is important is that the classes do not to need to be balanced. We just assume that they fo follow a Bernoulli distribution. Um, and then we need a pre-processing step where we normalize all the pixel values. So we get rid of the illumination factor. And then we define again um, the least squares loss over a class of convolutional neural networks. And this is the the probability vector that the probability vector we get out of our network this is our um prob uh, the true um vector which is either one zero or zero one so two uh, two unit vectors two unit vectors and um one can rewrite this this um as a problem which only depends on the a posteriori probability so only on a second entry of our convolutional neural network so in the end the problem breaks down to finding an estimator for the conditional class probability sophie i yeah. think it would be good if we could conclude rather soon Okay, thanks. Uh, then I skip that. So, okay, the, the final result we could show is that if we have different assumptions, um, like the object is completely visible, the template functions are Lipschitz, and um, some sort of separation criterion between the classes. So we, we need to be able to distinguish between the two, two template functions. Then we get a, a rate on the misclassification error of our estimator of, of this size here. And um, this is again our approximation error, and this is the, the, the rate for the complexity. And in the end, if we chose our, choose our n uh, larger than, than this, this term here, depending on d, then this misclassification error converges to zero. So we are also not confronted by, by the curse of dimensionality in any sense, because in the end we have some, some rate of one over root n somehow. Um, I'm pretty sure that this is not an optimal rate, um, but at least it's a first r result um, which deals with the sort of, perspe of the perspective of an image classification problem. And we also saw some interesting underlying approximation theory on convolutional neural networks. So, okay, let me conclude very quick. What we have learned today, we, we talked about two different things. Actually, we talked about fully connected neural networks and, and the main take home message is that we are interested in combining all three aspects of, of deep learning together and be able to include the optimization algorithm. So um, here the question is to, to the result I showed you before, how can we extend it to multiple hidden layers and is there a way to analyze this over parameterized regime? For the second problem, the, there are of course many, many extensions. How can we include background noise, multiple objects, and maybe we could also um, sub replace these constant chips by, by functions to describe local deformations. So you see there are many, many open questions left. And for now, I, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Thanks. A great talk. Um, uh, yes, so I think people who are still here can now ask a lot of questions if they want to. I will stop recording. <laughs>